Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Would you stand with us as we sing? Greetings in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take a seat for a moment, if you would. Just a couple of quick things, and we will continue on. First of all, everyone, welcome. It's great to see you if you're a guest this morning. Before you leave, at that table, there's a banner hanging up there. There's some, a card to fill out. If you tell us a little bit about yourself, we've got a welcome gift for you, and we'd like to pass that on to you. Uh, there are some new things going on, a few things that are coming in the, in the next few weeks. Uh, a couple things with women's ministries. We've got uh, the next fall class sign-ups and, and getting signed up for a book and everything is going on. 
starts in September, so you can do that out there. They're also having a day, kind of day treat, day retreat going on called Faith on Fire. On October the 8th, you can start getting signed up for that. Also, at the end of August, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not. It's on the 8th. No, okay, I don't, it's on October 15th. Okay, sorry. I read it wrong. Thank you very much. Um, but either way, you can get signed up out in the foyer for Faith on Fire. I'm sorry. Uh, Also, at the end of this month, we are offering a uh, short-term, six-week, I think, class, I believe it's six weeks, uh, of a grief recovery group for those who have experienced loss. It doesn't have to be a recent loss. It could be. It could be from something just from in the past, and it's a chance to sit down and and talk through some things. Rick and Teresa Long will be leading that class. You'll be hearing more about that in the next few weeks, but we want you to know about that. That's starting Wednesday, October no, no, it's not. Wednesday, August 31st. <laughs> so the last thing is fall kickoff is coming up on August 28th. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sunday, August 28th. There's some handouts out there. We'd love you to take one and invite somebody. It's a normal order to the morning, Sunday school, discipleship classes, and our worship service. Afterwards, we have a big cookout, and there's games and bounce houses and stuff like that for kids and maybe adults as well. Uh, we would encourage you. We're going to provide the hamburgers and the hot dogs and all that. But if you could bring a side dish or a dessert or both to share with others, that would be awesome. Uh, We also encourage you to wear your favorite team or school gear. So whether it's your high school, college, your favorite pro team, whatever it is, wear it since we're getting back into fall and football and all those routines. Just have fun with it and wear your favorite team or school gear that day. It's a great day to invite a friend. Invite them for the whole morning. Invite them to come to lunch and everything afterwards. And be part of that. Be part of that day. There's invitations out there in the foyer. Uh, if you're not getting the newsletter, let us know. Everything's in there and more, and we'll get that to you. So I'm going to ask April Nice. She's going to come and read uh, from Colossians for us this morning. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against you, forgive each other, as the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is in the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Be a thankful people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom in singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and give thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord.
the falling rain like waters rise flood this place we reach for you we cling to you oh lord fairest lord jesus Shine down on me. 
Let your love shine through me in the Friends, we're going to pray together here in a moment. And, uh, every week in the newsletter, we've got prayer requests in there, so you can always look to that as to help you know how to pray. You know, for those who are worshiping with us online, you can always put in the comments a prayer request. We've got people looking at that, and we'll be praying for you. I want to be praying for Ashley Marquez. She has surgery tomorrow, and praying for, obviously, successful, smooth surgery and recovery and everything for her, and pray for her and her family. And just a reminder, last week we had Rob and uh, Colleen Hintz, missionaries. You know, they did remind us to pray for them, and not just them, all our missionaries. So just a reminder to, sometimes in the moment we think of those things, and then days and weeks go on, and other things are happening, but be praying for Rob and Colleen, their family, and our missionaries this morning around the world. And, uh, as you might imagine, we don't usually have the baptistry up here, but here in a little while, uh, Nate is going to be a baptized will be celebrating the sacrament of baptism with him as a church family together and that'll be a, a wonderful moment together so let's pray together heavenly father paul we just read it paul said we're to be a thankful people lord i sure hope we are we're coming today for you to profess and proclaim the things we believe to be true about you to tell of the good things that you've done in our lives lord before we ask you to do anything else we want to praise your name you are the greatest and the fairest of them all. You are Lord over all the nations. You're also the Lord of our church, our families, our, our hearts. You're our redeemer and our rescuer. You're our father and friend. You're the one who came to us and loved us first. Lord, we know what it is to be loved. We know what it is to love others because you loved us first. In that sorry state we were in, Lord, you came to us. You've offered us forgiveness, redemption, salvation, life, a relationship with you, a life that is unending with you, Lord. And we have to praise your name. We thank you for a love that shines into all our circumstances. We thank you for the light of your joy, the light of your peace, the light of your truth that we've just sung about, Lord, that literally really shines into our hearts and minds and, and lives, whether things are good or bad. And we want to praise your name. Lord, Paul writes in that passage, just thinking about it this morning, we're, we're here today together because of you. We're united by your love because of you. We have peace, a wholeness about us because of you. Lord, everything in our lives speaks to your goodness, your presence, your trustworthiness. And so, Lord, we want to praise your name this morning. And Lord, it's because of you, it's because of all those things we've sung about that I just mentioned, your power, your faithfulness, your love, your, your grace, your, your presence with us. It's because of all that we, we bring these requests to you. And we pray for the likes of, of Ashley and her family. We pray for a, 
successful surgery tomorrow and a, and a quick recovery. We pray that you'd watch over and bless their family. Lord, we pray for Rob and Colleen, Lord, who are still in the States, but will in the very near future be headed back to New Zealand. We think of them and our missionaries today who are literally spread all over the world. Would you encourage them today? Would you work through them today? Would you resource and equip them, Lord, for the work you've called them to do? And really, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ as part of the church of the Nazarene, but part of the church of Jesus Christ, who are everywhere today and lifting up your name, meeting together, Lord. Lord, that fills my heart with joy to know I've got friends all over the world praising your name, coming together through the bond, the perfect bond of love we April read a little bit ago. But Lord, these requests to you, Lord, they're, they're many, they're varied. In the center of it all, Lord, is a need for you. A need for you to act, to respond, to move, to speak, Lord, in some way. And we're counting on you to do just that, to keep your promises, to do the things you said you would do to show up now like you have before. Would you please be faithful to do that, Lord? We believe that you will. Thank you for this time to worship you, Lord. Thank you for this time to come together and celebrate who you are and what you're doing. We pray all this in your wonderful name. Amen. Folks, just a reminder about our offering. The offering plates are out there in the foyer. You can give online through the Tide app, through the website. You can Give through the, send it in through the mail, and obviously you can drop things off there in the, in the offering plate. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this chance to give to you as you have given to us. Lord, may this be given uh, freely and just uh, with the hope and the trust that you'll take them, these, these dollars and cents, and use them uh, for your goodness and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to dismiss our kids for Children's Church. They'll join us for the baptism here. At the end, while they're going out, let me just give a reminder. This doesn't involve everybody, but it does involve several. Um, we've got a parent meeting afterwards for those who are even considering going to Nazarene Youth Conference. Uh, every four years uh, in USA and Canada, the thousands, six, seven, something like that, thousand teens will gather for a conference for worship services and, and service projects, and, and there's some fun in there uh, as well. Uh, but it's in Tampa Bay, Florida next summer, and so we're having a parent meeting afterwards. You're going to be hearing a lot more about it as a church um, because we've got to raise some funds to get those, get those teens there. So, uh, but parents, just a reminder, we're going to meet in the room 101 after the service. And uh, yes, grab a piece of cake, then head in there and we'll go over some things. So, uh, If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to read several verses from there. And if you are able, I would ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. It'll also be on the screen for you. You can follow along there. We'll go over into chapter 12 a little bit as well. I'm sorry. It's not, it will not be up there, and that's due to my mistake. So I'm sorry about that. I'm making lots of mistakes today. I'm going to blame Pastor Jessica for that one as well. So, okay. And since she's not up here, I can, I can say that. Um, now, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we'll start with verse, verse 29. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from death. But others were tortured, refused to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. 
Yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had promised something better in mind for us so that, uh, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trip, trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, a champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God, beside God's throne. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right, I'm going to say this. On the surface of things, at least, or on paper, if you will, I think the idea or practice or habit of prayer, you know, it may not sound like very much. On the surface of things. Uh, it may not sound like something significant or, or powerful. When, when we de describe prayer, again, you know, kind of on paper, we're going to write it out. Being quiet, talking and or listening, to a God that we very much believe in but cannot see, some people might wonder, well, what's the good in that? Being quiet, talking, listening for minutes on minutes or, or longer to a God you can't see, what's being accomplished when we do that? Some might think it's an exercise in, in futility. And, and we can't perfectly explain how prayer works. You know, when we say amen, is that like hitting the send button or something? I'm guessing not, but we, I don't know, we can't exactly say how, how that whole process works. A couple of weeks ago, though, we heard from Jesus uh, on the subject of prayer. Now, in case you weren't aware, we hold Jesus in pretty high esteem as Savior and Lord. Paul tells us he is supreme ruler over all of creation. And here's what he told us about prayer. I think we do have that, right? Oh, good. I did something right. Okay. <clears throat> That's not it. Okay, I'm going to just, I'll read it myself. And... This is what Jesus says about prayer. He says, and so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you, what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. There we go. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? We may not understand the whole process of prayer, and maybe it does seem kind of like a feeble old thing to sit quietly for minutes upon minutes or, or longer, and for some, prayer might seem like an insignificant practice. But Jesus tells us there that not only will we be heard by God, that God will answer, He will respond, He will provide. So if we don't give up, if we keep on praying, if we pray through to God until He answers, if we keep bringing ourselves, keep bringing that person, keep bringing that situation to God and genuinely seeking the heart of God, not just seeking what we want, but what God wants in the situation, Jesus says God will absolutely give to us. So despite our limited understanding of how all things prayer works, and maybe despite the appearance of just being quiet and what in the world good are we doing, Jesus tells us not just here and other places too, that prayer is effective and God values our prayers. This last week I came across a prayer that was written in the 13th century from a man named Bonaventure. And it was so wonderful, I wanted to share it with you. Would you put that up there, Carter? Here's the prayer, and let me, I'm gonna read it slowly, but follow along with me. He says, O oh Lord Jesus, may my heart ever seek you, find you, meditate on you, speak of you, and do all for the praise and glory of your name, with humility and discretion, with love and delight, with perseverance to the end. Oh, Lord Jesus, may you ever be my hope, my entire confidence, my riches, my delight. Lord Jesus, may you be my pleasure, my joy, my rest and tranquility, my peace. Lord Jesus, may you be my food, my refuge, my help, my wisdom, my treasure. In you, Lord Jesus, may my mind and heart be ever fixed and rooted immovably. Amen. My church family on prayer, or on paper, prayer may not sound like a lot, but can you imagine the power, the significance, the effectiveness of praying a prayer like that daily, weekly, often, of how God might respond and give to us? 
I think the idea of faith, again on the service, might have might be a bit, little bit like prayer. Maybe not sound like a whole lot. Faith is a very common word in our world. It gets thrown around all over the place. It's obviously a very popular and oft used word for us as Christians. For lots of people, faith is equated with just simple belief. You believe in something, you believe in someone, you have faith. Or faith gets equated with hope and hoping for the best. I think we hear that a lot, right? You, I have faith that's going to work out. You're just kind of hoping for the best, even though you may have no idea if it's really going to work out well at all. And if that's all faith is, just simple belief, just hoping, hoping against hope that it's all going to work out, then I'll tell you what, faith doesn't sound like very much and it doesn't sound very powerful at all. But the writer of Hebrews here in chapter 11 and 12, I think, helps us with the idea of faith. I didn't read it, but the first verse of Hebrews, did I give that to you, Carter? Would you put that up there if I did? But first verse, if you have your Bible still open, the writer of Hebrews says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. If you read this whole chapter in chapter 11, you will find over and over again the common phrase, by faith. It was by faith. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. It was by faith that many years ago, the Lord helped us to know what to do, Crystal and I. Um, I was in seminary, and I was working full-time, but wasn't making much money. Crystal was working full-time, again, not making much money, and we were struggling to make it like so many couples early on know what, exactly what that's like. And we were wondering if it was time to start a family, but man, I just couldn't see logically, financially, it didn't seem to make any kind of sense, and just wasn't sure what to do, and prayed about it. And I'm telling you, I can remember the exact place I was in Olathe, driving in my car at a stoplight, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, John, it's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. It's okay to start a family. And that may sound silly, but it was by faith that felt like it was good to go forward. And the Lord's been keeping that promise of taking care of us for 17 plus years now since we had kids. It was by faith that we showed up, came to Blue Springs Nazarene at all. We answered a call from district superintendent to allow our name to be considered by the church board. Here. We talked to the board over Skype. We came for an interview. Some of you remember meeting in that gym. We ate breakfast and we answered all these questions from everybody. It's really fun to have no idea what questions are coming your way from people. Prayed and felt like God was telling us to come here. And you felt the same. That was almost 10 years ago. By faith we came here. Most amazing of all. And I'm telling you, this story ought to be in Hebrews chapter 11. It was by faith. I'm looking around for her. Where is my wife? She left early. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know where she's dead. So just kidding. But it was by faith that I got this most beautiful and amazing woman, first of all, to go on a date with me, and it was by faith that I got her to marry me. I've told her before, and this is, I'm not going to tell it all, I had the smallest amount of faith that she would even say yes to the first date, and she did. I had a little bit more faith, but I shouldn't, probably shouldn't have if I'd known the whole story. I also had a little bit of faith that she would say yes to the second date after what I learned later was a less than stellar first date. And I'm telling you, if you knew the whole story, it should be in Hebrews chapter 11. Thank the Lord. It was by faith. Okay, now a little more seriously, though, from chapter 11. It was by faith that the writer of Hebrews lists all these people. It's not because of themselves. It's not because they had great abilities and resources. But these people that he lists by having confidence in God, by believing that God is who he says he is, by hoping that he would keep his promises and entrusting God with their lives. It was by faith the Israelites obey God when he said, go forward, and they're looking at a, at a big, huge body of water, and it was going to be okay, and it was okay. It was by faith that Rahab risks her life, believes the testimony of strangers, saving lives, saving her own life. It was by faith that Daniel survives the lion's den. It's by faith that people like Elijah and Elisha escaped the sword. It's by faith that others like Samson went from weak to strong at the end of his life. It was by faith that Gideon is able to gain victory with a ridiculous battle plan and pretty meager army. It's by faith that the widow of Zarephath would get her son back with some help from Elijah. The writer of Hebrews says it's by faith that people like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hanani, Micaiah, Zechariah and others, these prophets stayed faithful, proclaimed God's message when people really didn't want to hear it. And they endured all sorts of torment and torture and even death. It was by faith that they were able to stay faithful. It wasn't like being stronger than everybody else, smarter than everybody else. They didn't have more resources. It's not because the, the, the government was behind them. It was by faith. 
Faith in God, faith in who he is, faith in his ability to keep his promises, faith that resulted in confidence, confidence in God, that they could entrust their lives, their families, their fates into his hands. Faith that turned into action because they believed in what God had called them to do. And when they put their faith in him, victories were won and people were saved and, and the message was spread and God's good purposes came to fruition and the glory of God was revealed and the kingdom grew. It was by faith. Not might, not power, not us, not them. Faith in God. Like I said, I think on the surface of things, faith for some people may not, may not add up to much. It doesn't seem like much. But it's far more than just believing in something. I still kind of have faith that Santa Claus is out there, but yeah, I don't know. But it's about far more than just hoping for the best and hoping everything works out in a somewhat good way. Faith is essential to our lives. And let's not forget that the, at the heart of our faith is a relationship, a close, personal, intimate relationship with God. More than the creeds we recite. In a little bit, we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed together. It's a powerful statement. But more than the sacred words in this wonderful book, our faith is in a person, the living God. And our faith gets mixed in with his love and his grace and his mercy and more. Our faith gets built on God's past victories and faithfulness. Our faith come, it results in confidence in who he is and who he claims to be. Our faith comes from knowing him. It's a relationship. We talk, we listen, we learn. We actually know the almighty God who's also our father and our friend. But folks, my faith and yours is also part of the collective faith that exists in this room. My faith and yours is built on the collective wisdom and experience and holiness and the grace and love that gets extended. You all help inform and build my faith. I've seen you live out faith. I've, seen, I've watched you put faith in who God is, faith in what he's called you to do, faith that leads to obedience, and then you help me to live the same way. Our faith, everybody's here, is part of a much larger story that the writer of Hebrews reminds us goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years and includes these people. But we can also personalize this. Our faith is part of a much larger story for people we've known in our lives. My faith in, my faith in God, my faith in who He is, who He professes to be, how He operates, how He moves, how He speaks, my faith in His promise-keeping abilities and in what He's called me to do it's wrapped up and built and informed by people like my grandparents, V.H. and Esther Lewis and Bob and Dorothy Weathers. They helped me to see what it looked like to entrust themselves to God and follow Him. My faith is built on and formed by my parents who are sitting over here today. My faith is informed and built up, and I understand to be confident in Him because of people like Drs. John and Linda Seaman who were missionaries for the church in Nazarene, passed, they pioneered work in West Africa. Nobody had ever been there before. And I've mentioned it before, my faith gets wrapped up and is informed by and built on people like Jake and Clara Beadle, who grew up in my, or I grew up around them in my home church, and they just quietly and humbly served the Lord incredibly well. Folks, my faith in yours, it's not in a vacuum. We don't, it doesn't grow just magically on its own. Our faith is not independent of others. It's all part of a much larger and amazing story. I was reminded this past week in a devotional book, the writer said that none of us is the leading character of the story of our lives. It's someone else. Put those words up there, would you, Carter? He writes it this way. He says, as we submit our lives to what we read, and he's talking about reading Scripture, he said, we find that we are not being led to see God in our stories, but to see our stories in God. God is the larger context and plot in which our stories find themselves. So friends, let me throw out some questions for you this morning. Where is your faith in God leading you? I have all these stories. By faith, people did all these incredible things. Well, where is our faith in God? Where is it leading us? Who is our faith in God calling us to? What's it calling us to do? What person? What, what people? Somewhere to go. By faith, we read stories like this, and you all have read other stories. In other words, we've watched, we've heard, we may have even been witness to someone doing something by faith, God doing something through them. And it happened because those people took God and took their faith seriously. 
what they professed to know about God and what they believed, they lived it out. They trusted God was calling them. They trusted that God would care for them. They trusted that God would work through them. And so they went and they did. They obeyed. And God's purposes were done. I seriously doubt that my life is going to take a turn like Jeremiah's or some of these other prophets or Daniel's or Gideon's. I don't think those things are going to be happening to me. At this point in my life, I don't think God is calling me and my family to pioneer a work in some other country. Maybe he will, but I haven't heard that yet. Like two of my spiritual heroes, John and Linda Seaman. But what is my faith calling me to do? How is my faith in God calling me to grow? Is there something to borrow from the writer? Is there something that he's calling me in faith to let go of, to lay aside, to be done with? By faith, what is something, what is it that God wants to do in me or through me for his sake or for others' sake? I was talking with someone this last week and we pondered something about, you know, could the greatest enemy we face in the church just simply be that of indifference? We become indifferent or complacent when it comes to our faith. And we like to say where we're comfortable. And you know, if we're not careful, these bold claims in the gospel are all over, we can get awfully used to them. Came across the story the other day, many of you have read it, where Jesus tells you to take the, the lower seat at the dinner, don't take the head seat. And then he says, you shouldn't invite the people you know and love, you invite the stranger, the outcast, the poor. You know, what if we took like, things like that seriously? It's a bold claim, and boy, it's easy to read over it and just keep on going. We can get used to those things. My faith in God, yours does too, I believe. My faith in God tells me he's called me to love him more than anything. So what is his love compelling me to do? How is his love constraining me, inspiring me, motivating me? Am I even asking him questions like that? My faith in God calls me to love my neighbor. Do I even know my neighbor? Am I making any sort of efforts to get to know them? Folks, can I raise the question? I'm going to say I haven't done this yet either. It's in my mind. It's in my heart. But have we given any thought to the block party idea that Pastor Sarah talked to us about us weeks ago? Put together a packet to help you do it. I know that's not the be-all, end-all, the only way to get to know some folks. It's just a way to show some love and get to know some neighbors. And if the, whole, if the idea of inviting the whole neighborhood over scares you, how about one? One person over for some coffee and some cookies or for dinner. This week I spent time with the Aikens, who, by the way, had coffee and cookies for me when I got there. A plus, right? Gold star. And cookies to take home with me. It just kept getting better. But they... They talked about the fact they've got all these family coming over today for Rod's birthday celebration. That's, and that's wonderful. They talked about the call of to love and invest in this big and growing family. So by faith, over and over, and they will share the presence and the grace and the truth and the love of God with their family. And that's the first ministry we have, isn't it? And folks, that's only part of the message, I think, from the writer of Hebrews. We could talk about lots more, and I'm just going to say this real quick. The book of Hebrews was written to a church who was on fire for God. We say that all the time. Are you on fire for God? I don't know if that's a helpful metaphor or not. But the, the, the church of Hebrews, life they got beat up by life, and then the fire began to wane, and so Paul comes and talks to them. Sometimes we find ourselves, you might today, find yourself in a place where you feel like giving up, or you're losing hope, feeling a little lost or alone. And I'm not trying to make light of any of that. Those are very real. I've been there and I'll be there again. But one of the things I think we have to ask is, what does our faith tell us when we're in those moments? Our faith that goes generations back, our faith that comes from, that is informed by the people sitting around us in this room right now. Our faith tells us that God is always with us, doesn't it? Our faith tells us to keep persevering and enduring. Our faith tells us that God is at work no matter what we see or feel. Our faith tells us that God walks with us even in the darkest spots. Our faith tells us to stay obedient because God will see us through. So when we're down or we're losing hope, and I know it's not easy, but what does our faith tell us? My friends, I've, every once in a while I reference the lectionary. 
Every week, if you want a, reading, a scripture reading guide, they'll give you Old Testament, a psalm, a gospel reading, and then something from Paul or Timothy or somewhere else in the New Testament. One of the readings for today is from Isaiah 5, where God sings a song about the state of his beloved vineyard. That isn't much of a vineyard anymore. How much he loved them and invested them, and they've ruined it. And he laments the fact. I'm remind, I mention that day because of what the writer of Hebrews tells us here at the end. Folks, if we, want to, if we don't want to become indifferent to things, if we don't want the vineyard to get all crummy, then the, the most important thing we need to do with our faith is keep our eyes, our hearts, our minds centered on Jesus Christ, which he tells us here at the end. Jesus is the one who began the work of faith in us. He's the one sustaining and continuing that work through us today with his Holy Spirit, and someday our faith will be perfected with all these other people. So I say that, and I don't say it lightly at all, but we can't lose hope. Regardless of circumstances, and I know sometimes circumstances are bad, even if you're tired and worn out, our faith reminds us that Jesus knows what it is to be down and out, discouraged and defeated and feeling alone, and he's with you. By faith, you can keep going. By faith, you are going to make it through. By faith, he will keep his promises. By faith, he will continue to give himself to you. And by faith, we're with you. And we must not become indifferent to God, to who he is, to what he's calling us to do, to the work of grace that he's calling to us. By faith, we can and we are spreading and sharing and living the message of love and grace and joy and salvation of Christ to others. By faith, we can answer the call of God. We can take part in his mission. We can be part of the ever-growing faithful cloud of witnesses we're told about here. Go to the next slide, Carter. Follow along with me one more time, thinking about keeping our eyes on Jesus. Actually, why don't you just close your eyes with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, may our hearts ever seek you and find you. May our hearts meditate on you, speak of you. And may we do all of this for your praise and glory of your name. Help us to do so with humility and discretion. Lord, help us to do it with love and delight, with perseverance to the end. Lord Jesus, may you ever be our hope and our entire confidence. Lord Jesus, would you be our riches, our delight, our pleasure. Lord Jesus, may you ever be our joy, our rest and tranquility and our peace. Lord Jesus, be our food, our refuge our help, our wisdom, and our treasure. In you, Lord Jesus, may our minds and our hearts be ever fixed and rooted immovably. In your name we pray. Amen. By faith, my friends, don't gloss over it. Don't skip over it. It's a powerful statement to live by faith. And we get to hear a story of faith uh, this morning as we celebrate the sacrament of baptism. Uh, dear friends, Christian baptism is a sacrament signifying participation in the faith, it, it, excuse me, signifying participation by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and incorporation into his body, the church. It is a means of grace proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul declares that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. We are buried with him through baptism so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are raised to walk in newness of life. As we have been united with him in his death, we will also be united with him in his resurrection. The Christian faith, into which we are all a part of, and the Christian faith, which Nate is going to be baptized into, is affirmed through something called the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to ask you to stand and read this together with me. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Nate, I'm going to ask you to come up here. Nate, I've been, I've been practicing. I've been trying to practice too. <laughs> I mispronounced your name last week, <laughs> and I might do it again. Mejia. 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 Ah, so close. Virginia told me wrong earlier. Actually, <laughs> actually, she told me right. But I was, uh, um, before you share, let me ask you this. Actually, hold on to that for a second. Yes, sir. Nate, that statement of faith we just read. Will you be baptized into this faith? If so, answer. I will. I will. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you believe that he saves you now? If so, say, I do by faith. I do by faith. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, will you follow him all the days of your life, growing in grace and the love of God and neighbor? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. To church, his church family, will you, who witness these vows, do all in your power to support Nate as he strives to live in Christ? Will you pray for him, encourage him, instruct and lead him, and will you live in such a way before him that he may follow your example in Christ's likeness? If so, answer, we will. Good. Nate is going to share a story of faith with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to apologize in advance if I get choked up or start getting teary-eyed. <laughs> well, to start off, I just want to say God is good. He definitely is. Well, to the people who don't know, my name is Nathaniel Mejia, but everyone knows me by Nate, and you can call me Nate. And today is a special day for me, and I know for God, it is a beautiful moment. I wanted to share with you guys today a little bit of things that God done in my life. And I'm not going to go years back, but I want to rewind a couple months ago. I was in a dark place in my life. Maybe it was even one of the darkest places I ever been in my life. I had a family whom I lost because of choices I made. From there, I made even more poor decisions. From having a negative attitude to drinking every night and just feeling down. Well, with all that came, on, came almost every other struggle in the book. At least that's how it felt. I was being irresponsible hanging with the wrong people, and doing what I felt was right for my own personal pleasure. I was kind of falling behind on bills and it became hard to catch up, but I did that to myself. Then on March the 18th of this year, I was assaulted and robbed by someone who I thought was a friend. I was put in the hospital, blood coming out of my ears, a fractured nasal bone, and a concussion. That's when I really felt the downward roller coaster in my life. I was hurt, not so much by the physical state, but my emotional and spiritual side. I've been a boxer, I took plenty of hits, and that's not what bothered me. But my pride was hurt. I felt like I had something stripped from me. And I wanted revenge. And trust me, I knew what I had to do to get that revenge. So I made my mind up when I got out of the hospital, I was gonna go have my revenge. But when I got home, I was getting ready to go find this man and I felt God, I felt God. <clears throat> Sorry. God came to me and showed me everything I had to lose. And it was a spiritual warfare going on in my head. But my heart cried for change. 
So fast forward, and I decided I was going to go to church. Well, I woke up that morning, was getting Haven ready, just decided to go to church, and I didn't even know why. But I go out to my car, get Haven strapped in, and I noticed my car was trash. Well, someone broke into my car, stole my tablet and the last bit of money I had. And it hit me that the devil is real, and he wanted to keep me where I was. But I loaded this up, and I made my way to church. And I walked in a little bit after the service was ending. And if I remember correctly, that Sunday, the 27th of March, was about the prodigal son. Coincidence? Maybe. But I went up to that altar, and I got on my knees, and I was greeted by Ed and Don with Pastor Jonathan. And that day was the start of my life. At least that's how it felt. After that day, my heart was on fire for God. I gave up my control and gave the steering wheel to God. As I was trying to get back on my feet, I had no money. I barely had food, but I still had a job. But that's okay, because I gained family from the church. And most of all, I gained God's grace. He provided for me every day. And it might not have been what I wanted, but it was what I needed. My struggle wasn't over, though. Even though I was changing for the good, there was still madness going on in my life. I was $2,000 behind on rent, was about to get evicted, but I still stayed close to God. And one day someone asked me, Nate, how do you seem so calm when all this is happening in your life? And I said, because I give it to God and I know he's got me. Well, fast forward, I learned a lot, gained a lot. God took care of me. He gave me my family, and he's been helping me restore relationships. He even provided a lawyer free of charge to help me get the money to pay off my debt and to help me start over. God even led me to a new career. As of July the 29th, I made a commitment to serve and protect our country and the United States Armed Services as a Navy sailor. I ship out the 23rd to Great Lakes for my basic training. So this morning, I just really wanted to share with you guys a little bit of what's God done for me and to bring honor and acknowledgement to God's work in my life. I am grateful for everyone who's been with me and for me on this journey. And this is only the beginning. I will stay close to God and I will stay in touch with the church to give updates and I hope to see everyone again. Until then, all I ask for is nothing but prayer and a farewell as I leave. Keep my family in your prayers. And again, thank you for everything. And thanks be to God. Amen. Anything else in those pockets? All right, yeah, take everything out of those pockets. All right, here's the runner. just going to add uh, one thing here just for Nate. Uh, uh, as someone who's watched uh, the men of this church just come around Nate, you know, they've met for meals and prayed together, talked, texted, and been part of the journey. It's exactly what the church is supposed to do, and it's been wonderful to watch, and it's been great to see the Lord's work in Nate's life. Nate, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, we're going <laughs> to There is a little celebration afterwards with some cake and everything like that, that you're more than welcome to join us here in just a moment. We're going to sing a closing song together, so let's stand and sing.
your benediction this morning from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you His favor and give you His peace. Go in His peace. Amen.